Welcome. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am that woman who's been rambling at you for the past six years. Liv. God, it has been six years. How fucking weird is that? I mean, it's probably a lot less weird for you listeners, but as the person who's been doing it for this long, it's seriously fucking wild. Like it has both flown by and seems like I've been doing it forever. I mean, it's bananas. I mean, it's cool. Obviously, it's more cool than wild. It's wildly cool, even. And to celebrate six years of this podcast, I am here with a special Q&A episode that's going to feature not only the answers to your questions and some of the fucking lovely messages that you all sent in, but also some clips from favorite episodes of yours and mine, because why the hell not, you know? I also got so many amazing questions and comments from you all that we're going to do the same thing on Friday, but with clips from conversation episodes and reading episodes peppered in amongst your amazing questions and comments. I've had so much fun going through everything that you all shared with me and pulling some of my own favorite clips along with yours. It's seriously fun to look back over these, you know, the last six years and see how I've changed and grown and all the damned content I've put out because there's so much. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. Um, holy shit. Anyway, uh, side thought uh, that just came from this, but I really wish I had the ability to look up how many times I've used the word fuck in the six years of this show. Like, that would bring me so much joy. <laughs> Thank you all so much for submitting so many amazing questions and comments. Like I said, it was a real thrill reading through everything, and I want to get to as many as possible. So just a heads up that I have shortened some of the entries that I got, cut out some things for time, and if you asked a few questions in one entry, I may not have answered them all. But I did read everything that you all submitted, so thank you. Uh, it means so much to me, your fucking kind words about me and the show, and oh my god, anyway. Fuck, you're all just super cool and nice, and it's so fucking weird that this is my life. So, you know, thanks for contributing to that. Also, I have to say that in a in a true twist of fate, of dramatic irony, for the first time in years, I would argue years, I managed to record an hour's worth of half improvised content, half scripted on the wrong microphone. Um, I don't know why I didn't check it. I always check it. It's just truly like the irony of it being the six year anniversary of me being six years of podcasting for a living. And I used the wrong microphone. Um, that is all to say that there are going to be portions of this episode where the audio is not as good. Um, because I improvised some stuff that I, I realize I can't, I can't improvise again in the same way. So I'm going to pull from the audio that I did. It was recorded with my computer's microphone instead of, you know, the really professional podcasting microphone that I own that I invested in. Anyway, just to explain some, uh, funnier audio, I'm re-recording the scripted parts so they sound good. Um, but some of the improv is just staying in because it was good and I'm not doing it again. <laughs> Okay, let's dive right in, shall we? <laughs> this is episode 220, six years of dangerous gods and castration foam, an anniversary special. The bloody castrated bits of Uranos fly across the land before falling into the sea just off the coast of Cyprus. A foam erupts from where the bits plunged into the depths of the sea, and from that castration foam was born the goddess of love and beauty, Aphrodite. What a story, what an origin, what a queen. We can't have a celebration of this podcast without the castration foam. It's simply impossible. It's one of my my claims to fame, my pride and joy. 
castration foam. <laughs> now I'm starting off today's questions with one from Emily B, both because she had a fun question to start things off and because there's a bit of a running joke on my Patreon uh, due to the volume of Emily's that I've had asking questions on my God of the Month episodes over time. And I think you're one of them, Emily. So thank you. So Emily B, she says, congrats on six years, Liv. If you could only see one play, any play, even ones that are fragmentary or lost at the city Dionysia, which play would you see and why? All right. You know, I thought about this a lot and I had a few answers originally, but I'm just going to go with the number one. And that is just staying true to myself. As much as I would have loved to see Back Eye, I think, for the violence of it all, I'm going to pick Medea. And that is purely because of the crane because of the you know the the me- the machine um, that they had around a, this time period for the plays and that was uh, it was a crane it hung above the stage it was primarily like 90 percent of the time it was used to bring gods over the stage for the deus ex machina right that's where the words that's where the phrase comes from gods in the machine um and it so it was used to pull gods over the the stage so they looked like a fucking god flying over everybody and then euripides went and he was like I'm going to use it not only for a woman in a chariot holding her dead children that she's just murdered, but also it's going to be drawn by dragons. And he just was like, fuck everything. And I just, what I wouldn't give to witness the shock in the audience when you see a a machine that is traditionally used for gods used for this, with this purpose. And I mean, the bonus is if like, I could actually watch Euripides watching them react you know oh my god my heart could you fucking imagine next is from freya and they say if you could be a god or goddess who would you choose to be and why and who would your romantic partners be interesting interesting i think i'm just gonna go with the absolute easiest which is just that i fucking love aphrodite you know i love that she had freedom and she could do what she wanted both in terms of her life and sex and she's like the only one who has that so definitely aphrodite no question and i have a real Real thing for her romance with Aries. So easy peasy. Aphrodite and Aries here for them. And next, the letter J. They say, if Atlantis isn't considered to be a myth because it's only in Plato, is the idea of soulmates, as described in the symposium, also not considered a myth? Or was it largely taken up by people of the time? So as I understand it, it is it is all it is very similar to Atlantis, this idea of soulmates. Um I would almost say it's similar to Atlantis in the way that like modernity has taken it as a myth, you know, but I don't really think that it was much in the ancient world because if you, if, especially if you listened to my newest episode on the symposium, you know, like, I don't know how much Plato believes that either, you know, in the same way that I don't know if Plato believed any of the shit he talked about when it came to Atlantis. I think it is similar for the soulmates. I think the soulmate story is like adorable and weird and lovely, but I don't think that Plato is like actually presenting it like an idea. What he's doing is just like using it as a device to talk about love broadly. Um, but also like most of the symposium is like kind of hinging on the ideas of the Erastes Aramanos relationships, right? Like their relationships between men in ancient Athens. And so I think the soulmates bit it's just kind of like complimentary as like a notion. But I also think, and this is like in a lot of the stuff you'll read on it, that it is also just him making fun of Aristophanes for like saying dumb shit, right? Because it's said by Aristophanes and Aristophanes said a lot of dumb shit, as we all know. Um, So like, I don't want to lessen the impact of it because I do think it's an important story and it's really like lovely. But I also, I don't really think Plato took it seriously at all. And thus like, Yeah, I, I, you know, I haven't looked into this too deep, but based on my knowledge of it all, I think it's really similar to Atlantis. Like, I don't really think that it got picked up in the ancient world very much at all. It was just sort of like this weird ass thing that Plato made Aristophanes say. But it's a great question because I'm glad you asked that. Next, we have one from Harry, who says, Yo, Liv, if you're reading this, a genuinely warm hello. Firstly, amazing work getting to six years. I have no idea how a person with ADHD can spend so much time on one project and finish parts of it over and over. As a wannabe author with ADHD, I'm very impressed. What tips do you have for making a podcast for so long and for balancing your personal life as you go? Okay, I want to answer this um, because I think that talking about my ADHD and like, because I basically learned that I have ADHD like 
in the time of this podcast, right? Like I didn't know I had it like say three years ago. I had no idea. Um, and so I think that it's really helpful to talk about because I'm like a woman in her thirties who just figured out that she has fucking ADHD and has had it literally forever. It's just that it never really became obvious enough that I figured it out. So for me, like, so there's a shit ton about this podcast that I don't get done. Like I, I just don't get to do things. And, and like having Michaela, um, as my assistant producer, which is her new title, by the way. Um, having Michaela as my assistant producer ha has helped immensely because one, she doesn't have ADHD. And so she kind of sometimes keeps me uh, on track, but also that she does all the things that like I've always wanted to do, but never did because of the ADHD, you know, like the YouTube just kind of like sat vacant for a long time because I didn't do it. And like so many things are just like extra and great. Um, because I just wasn't doing them before because of my ADHD. So like, I don't, I think I look like I have a lot of shit together, but it's just because you don't know the stuff that I'm not doing, right? Like you have no way of do knowing. So I assure you, there's a lot that I just don't get done because of ADHD. And my ADHD hinges on deadlines, which I know is really common. And so just like, I get the podcast done because I have to, I have to get it done on these days contractually. And because like, I need to in my brain. But like, yeah, I mean, I wish I could say I had like the answers, but I honestly feel like I'm kind of a living disaster at most times. I just sort of had have made it work. Um, but I think that's kind of key to ADHD is you, you find a way to make for you to make it work. Uh, but also like you, you're talking about authors, like I still haven't finished the fucking novel I've been talking about for the entire six years of this podcast. So don't think I have my shit together. Like that's a good example of my ADHD falling apart. I've also been working on a proposal for another book for literally ever and it never gets done because everything all my time is taken up by the things that have to get done and so everything else just falls away anyway I don't think I have my shit together uh, is the answer to that question I definitely thought I would have um smarter things to say but I think this is helpful anyway uh <laughs> in any case Harry also said secondly Greek gods are problematic to put 21st century west sensibilities on it but us millennials or millennial adjacent people seem to get into classical mythology via shows and books where the gods are humanized and in many cases likable how do you reconcile the horrid historical reality of greek myths with a personal love of the many interpretations and retellings do you have a favorite or an under underappreciated example um this is a good question and so like i also just want to make it clear that like i don't think that I don't know. I think horrid historical reality is is being too mean to them. And I know that I, I made you think that way. So it's no blame on you. Um, but I do think that like, it's just it wasn't that it wasn't bad, you know, like, it's just different. And I think it's important to talk about how it was back then is bad by today's standards. And a lot of it was bad by standards back then, too. But like, in terms of the mythology, I don't really think that there's any reason for us to like, you know, judge the myths. I think we can judge the things that happen in an entertaining way. And that's why I have this show. But like, I still love them, right? Like, there's nothing about the mythology, no matter how horrifying it is, no matter the most horrifying of stories of Greek myth, let's say Procne and Philomela, that's no question, right? Like, that's the most horrifying story of myth, period. And like, I still love it. Uh, because it's interesting and it says a lot about what was happening and who was writing and why and all these different things. And like, I don't know, I don't think we have to dislike anything or like be like, see it as horrible. Um, it's just like, we can kind of look at it and then I don't know, it's really hard to describe, but all to say like, you know, things weren't that bad. And also like a lot of the stuff that I've said, and I've, I'm better at it now over the last few years, but like in early episodes of the show talking about treatment of women and stuff, like, most of our knowledge on the treatment of women, and this is going to come up later, so I won't say much, but like, it's based on Athens, right? And in Athens, the women in Athens were the most repressed of ancient Greece, but it's also where we get all our information from, for the most part. And so we tend to have this like, really bad view on women and myself included, I'm absolutely guilty of this, but it's really specific to Athens. We don't actually know a lot about how they lived elsewhere and like they could have had a lot more freedoms and things could have been a lot better and so I don't know there's just so much nuance <sighs> yeah there's just so much nuance and so much there and like I mean I could talk about this forever um but I'm gonna pull back but I do think that like I guess this is only even half of your question because you're talking about um shows and books and stuff like I do think that that sort of 
it's not like bad to have like say Disney's Hercules is the best example. Like it's just different. And like, I understand it for children. And then I kind of, I think there's nothing wrong with it. And I like to have be the kind of counter person, you know, there to be like, Hey, <laughs> Zeus was not a family man. Oops. Hera was not her, uh, Heracles's mother and oh my god he never rode Pegasus you know but like I think we can kind of have everything at once um in terms of underappreciated example I don't remember anything about this show I will admit I just know it existed and I know I watched it um as a Canadian I'm just gonna just say it anyway and that is Young Hercules I want to revisit it one because it has baby Ryan Gosling and he's Canadian um and two because it's Hercules and it has baby Ryan Gosling so I'm gonna just say that is under. Uh, appreciated, even though I don't remember anything about it except baby Ryan Gosling. Hey, remember that time I covered the satirical ancient epic that basically reenacts the Trojan War, but with tiny frogs and tiny mice and their tiny armor? <laughs> How is the ancient world even real? I love them so much. This is a clip from my Batrachomyomachia episodes. The mice sent their messengers all around, asking that everyone gather in the morning at the house of Brednar, Crumb Snatcher's father, Troxartos in the Greek. They did exactly this, and when all the mice had gathered together in Brednar's home, he began a speech to the assembled rodents. He said that he was the first to be harmed in this way by the frogs, with his son killed by their king, but that others would be next. They would have to do something about it. He spoke of his other sons. Both had also died tragically. One by a weasel who snuck up upon him, and the other in a wooden trap. The specification here that it's wooden may even be an allusion to that other wooden trap from ancient epic, the Trojan horse. Once he has told his story to the assembled mice, Brednar calls upon them all to arm themselves to prepare for a battle with the frogs. Brednar's speech rouses the mice to battle. They won't stand for this kind of murderous trickery on the part of the frogs. And so they prepare themselves for that battle, quote, and Ares, lord of war, armed one and all. And then, well, I have to quote some more because we get an idea of what exactly ancient mice might use as, as weapons and armor. And it is adorable. Quote, The greaves upon their shins were half a pod of green bean with its contents neatly gnawed. They'd worked all night on these and skillfully made cuirasses from a weasel they had flayed, its skin stretched on a reed frame. Each would wield the handle of an oil lamp for a shield. They brandished needles for long-shadowing spears, the brazen work of Ares. On their ears were helms of chickpea shells. All right, next up is from Kara or Kara? Uh, I don't know. Hey, Liv, I know you only play Assassin's Creed Odyssey, but I was wondering if you've ever looked into slash read the lore behind God of War. I've listened to almost every single episode and was surprised to never hear it mentioned. I think if you were to just read this question, my need to hear you talk about it would be fulfilled. Thanks to you and your team for all the hard work you do. Thank you. I'm reading this to fulfill your need. Um, but I've never played it. The only thing I know about it is like, I think I did once mention it in an episode on Minor Gods. I think it's called Minor God Madness. It's a very old episode and I'm going to forget the name of the character who's even in it, uh, in God of War, but it's some like daemon god of just a concept. In oh, Kratos, right? It's Kratos. I I'm not cutting this out. It's Kratos. Right? <laughs> I'm, I'm asking as if somebody's going to answer me. Um, anyway, I did talk about it in that episode because people had brought it up to me in the past. But, like, there's not really any mythos behind it. As far as I understand it, but I don't know anything about the game. Um, but as far as I understand it, it has, like, really no grasp in actual Greek mythology. So, 
I don't have a great answer, but I read this for you. Thank you. And next from Nicole Tony, who says, what are your favorite sites to see in Athens? I'm going in September and need recommendations, please. Thank you. Thank you, because people... So this is going to lead me to another thing. People DM me requesting um, where to go in Athens and Greece all the time. And I have to say, I I never answer, and I'm sorry. Um, that is primarily due to my own introversion in that, like, I really don't interact with a lot of people online because it stresses me out and I don't like, um, I'm just really bad with that stuff. But also I can't, I just, I get too many questions and like the, the answer is too broad and like it gets asked by this, by people all the time. So I need to just, I need to answer it here. Obviously most people are not going to hear this and they're still going to DM me, but I'm just saying anyway, here's your answer, I guess. Um, I mean, there's so much to see in Athens, like Google all the archeological sites. I would say the number one thing to do is get the combined ticket. This is a ticket that you can get at any of the these like seven archaeological sites in the sort of center of Athens. And what it does is it's like, it's good for, I think they said five days now. I feel like they changed it. It's like 30 euro. It's good for a bunch of days. And you can see all of the sites of these like seven sites um, for 30 euro. You save so much money, literally just by going to the Acropolis and the Agora, you've paid for it. So it's super great. It's a really good ticket. Um, and with that, you can see, let's see if I can name the seven off the top of my head. You can see the Acropolis and the slopes, just one side of the Acropolis. Um, it's all in one site. You can see the Agora, you can, which the Agora is where the Temple of Hephaestus is. And that is the best preserved, um, temple in Athens. It's beautiful. There are lots of parrots there. It's cool. Um, and then you can see Hadrian's Library, which is an incredible ancient site right off of Monastiraki Square. And you can see the Roman Agora, and you can see Hadrian's, oh, Hadrian's Gate doesn't count because it's actually not a site. You can just stand there. Never mind. You can see the Temple of Olympian Zeus. I'm at five. Oh, you can see Karamikos, which is the ancient cemetery. It's so cool. If you go in September, you might see tortoises fucking. I learned this. It's fucking season. Um, I saw them going at it in Karamikos and the Agora. I, yes, I promise I'm in my mid-30s. Um, and, oh, what's number seven? I think number seven is the Lyceum. And, and I think I have to admit now that I've still never been, which is really sad. I've been there like eight times. I don't know what I'm doing. Anyway, I think it's the Lyceum, which is like Plato's Academy. I'm saying this. I'm not sure. Anyway, get the combined ticket, see all the sites on the combined ticket. And honestly, then you've won. But also the Acropolis Museum is amazing. It's right down by the Acropolis. Um, you should go visit it just despite the British Museum because they've stolen all the stuff and they won't give it back. And then you should also make sure you see the National Archaeological Museum, which is a little farther. Uh, it's fucking incredible. It's enormous. You should spend a whole day there. It's unbelievable. That's where the so-called Mask of Agamemnon is. It's not actually Mask of Agamemnon, but it's incredible. There's a ton of Bronze Age stuff there. Um, oh my gosh. I fucking love the National Archaeological Museum. Oh, you can also see wall paintings from Akrotiri on, on Santorini. So like wall paintings, you know, from the, the site that was preserved by the volcano. These are Bronze Age wall paintings. So fucking colorful. It's unbelievable. We are talking like almost 4,000 year old paintings. So anyway, those are all the sites you absolutely have to see in Athens. And next from Cole, and they said, Hi, Liv. I've been listening to your podcast a couple years now, and I absolutely love it. I love all your episodes, but I really enjoy the play episodes best. They're always great. I have two questions, but I don't expect you to answer both. All right, let's see. First, you've mentioned having ADHD a few times, and I was wondering how you move past it, symptoms like executive dysfunction, for example, to work on your content. I want to focus on being a creator for a living as well, but some days I just can't seem to get out of my own way. Whew. I already answered some of that in that, like, I'm honestly still a mess. Um, but I think you just have to, like, pick the certain things that are necessary. So for me, like, the things, because I absolutely struggle with executive dysfunction, that's why I have so much trouble with, like, replying to DMs and emails and stuff because they stress me out for no reason. And so for me, it's like, okay, I absolutely have to get the episodes done in a week. So I do them because I have to. And some days it's a lot harder than others. Um, next week's episode, you're going to hear uh, one that I did specifically to cure my ADHD because I'd gotten back from Greece and I have so much trouble getting back into my routines and my routines are 
vital. Like if I do not wake up in the morning, come downstairs, make my coffee and sit at my desk immediately, like my whole day is shot and I will not be creative or, or productive at all. I have to do those things. It's also why I have trouble working while I'm over in Greece. So then I spend months preparing extra things for while I'm there. It's a whole mess um, that I've mastered, but also it's a disaster. But like, yeah, you sort of like figure out those things, your routine, what you need to do. But sometimes it's just like, sometimes I will literally only do the episodes I need to get done because they are more difficult or they're hurting my ADHD or like, it's just a bad week, you know, you just never know. But sometimes I will pick something that I know is super fun. So this week, I was like, okay, I've had a lot of trouble with my ADHD. I'm really not getting ahead of things. I'm really frustrated with myself. And so I was like, I would like I need to do an episode that's going to be just fun that I know that I know how to research. I know it's not going to, you know, mean that I'm going to have to read a ton of academic articles or all these history books or anything. I just need a fun thing that's going to be that's going to like with that level of fun, it's going to help my ADHD immensely. So I sat down to redo Bellerophon and the Chimera. And I've never had more fun in my life. Next week's episode is unhinged in the best possible way. Like I I had so much fun. And it completely rewrote my ADHD. And I've had an otherwise really productive week because that like kick started it. So when you're having a really bad week, I think just find a thing that you know, you're going to enjoy. um, Because I find it really, really helps. And next, my second question is more mythological. When I was a kid, I'm sure I remember Poseidon's son, Triton, being described as having two fish tails, as if they were his legs. But lately, everyone always describes him as a basic merperson. Merson, they offered? Oh, okay, I like Merson. With just one tail. Am I misremembering the two tails thing? Have I slipped into a parallel universe, Mandela effect style? Are there sources that describe him with two tails and I'm actually semi-correct? The world needs to know. It's me. I need to know. (laughs) <laughs> that was a, a great question thank you um there are almost certainly sources or visual representations of him with two tails don't worry i don't think that there's any cut and dry explanation of what triton looks like i absolutely think that the two tails is a thing i'm picturing mosaics i'm thinking some kind of roman mosaics would have him with two tails do some googling you're not crazy i promise Now, I don't dive into history all that often. Obviously, it's been happening more and more lately, but one of the first times I did it in one of my favorite episodes ever is when I dove into the very real ancient Greek poetess, Sappho. So let's listen to a bit of that, shall we? Sappho is one of those names that most people have at least heard in their lives. You've heard the name Sappho or the word sapphic, or at the absolute least, you've heard the word lesbian. And all of those come from this so-called 10th muse, the poetess of Lesbos, Sappho. Sappho was a poet on, yes, the island of Lesbos, hence lesbian, during the Archaic period. That is the 7th century. She was born around 612 BCE, making her quite ancient in terms of the sources that we know so well. Lesbos is far off in the northwest of the Aegean. It's remote and nowhere near the Greek mainland, much closer to what is now Turkey. As for the timeline and where Sappho sits within it, people like Hesiod and the possible Homer would have come before her, but she came long before the playwrights, the tragedians, and other notable people from the world of classical Greece, particularly classical Athens. She is also the only woman poet of the Archaic period that we have explicit evidence for. There are suggestions of others, references here and there, even by Sappho herself, but nothing explicit enough to be entirely sure that another woman was writing poetry at the same time as Sappho. Still, I mean, it was likely, let's be honest, she didn't exist in a vacuum. Sappho was certainly the first woman poet of ancient Greece in terms of the evidence we have. However, as much as she's often called the first woman poet ever, she is, in fact, not. The claim that she was the first woman poet is a Eurocentric myth that leaves out a Sumerian woman who came about 1,500 years before Sappho. 1,500 years. Her name was Enheduanna, and one day I will find enough sourcing to talk about her, too. (laughs) 
All right, this next thing is from Katya, who says, So I haven't got a question per se. I just have the highest praise. I've loved your podcast from the first second I found it through Ancient History Fangirl, when you all kept me sane during COVID. I've never been interested in ancient Greco-Roman history or mythology before due to how colonialism and racism have co-opted so much of the aesthetics, but you guys gave me a new way to look at this fascinating field. Small but massively important things like that the statues weren't originally meant to be white, the existence of LGBTQIA characters in ancient sources, the fact that so many of the ancient heroes of legend were actually legendary douche canoes. These facts have completely changed my view of ancient history and culture. Yay for bringing this fascinating field to the masses, specifically those who've been previously excluded from it. Yay for reclaiming truly fascinating shit that Nazis and other shitheads have tried to put their stank on. And I love everything you've done. The discussion episodes are amazing. The episodes breaking down plays are fascinating. And the series episodes on Atlantis and Sparta absolutely blew my mind. They end their message with, <laughs> Love all that you do, and I kind of wish I had a question, but you'll have to put up with a rant about how brilliant you are. I hope it's not too awkward to read. Receiving compliments is weird. And I love that. And you're right. And reading aloud compliments to myself is seriously weird. And I just have to remind myself that one, um, I know you guys, when you submit things, like you want to hear me read them. And that's a lot of the point. So I have to remind myself of that. But two, I think it's really like one, it makes me feel fucking great. Um, but also like, I think it's helpful to hear from others what they're taking from the podcast, I guess. Um, I don't know. I'm, this is me trying to justify reading compliments to myself aloud, but I don't, I realize I don't need to. So generally, thank you. A lot of these are, or a few of these are, are like that. And I think it, I mean, it certainly helped me. This is a lot for me too. So I'm going to stop, you know, trying to explain myself. And Jasper asks, have you covered the pilgrimage of Aeneas in Ovid's Metamorphoses? Have a good day. Thank you. This is a very quick answer. Not yet, but we are about to hit book 10 of Ovid's Metamorphoses just next week. And I think it's like book 12 or 13, maybe. So we're getting there. Just another few months, I think. And we will have read the wildness that is the end of Ovid's Metamorphoses. Next up from Cyrus. As someone from the middle of the Pacific Ocean, I was wondering what is the one of the most obscure topics and or deities that you have come across during your research for the podcast? Well, Cyrus, as somebody who lives not in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, but on an island in the Pacific Ocean, um, I'd love to answer your question. And I think my answer is Samothrace because I fucking love Samothrace. I think it's fascinating, amazing. And the um, Sanctuary of the Great Gods is is incredible and it's mysterious. Oh, I forgot I put this next question. Sorry, now I'm reading ahead in my own thing. This next question is really going to connect. So all I'm going to say here, the answer is Samothrace. Um, but also I realized, so on this last week's uh, conversation episode, I learned from Jerome Ruddick that uh, Crete had a goddess of nets. And that one really thrilled me too. Something about a goddess of nets. Good stuff. And which mystery cult would you want to know absolutely everything about if you had to choose? And that's where we're going to go back to Samothrace, because the answer is Samothrace. The Samothracian mystery cult is... It blows my mind. We don't know almost anything about it. It's this huge, sprawling temple complex on Samothrace that, like, I feel like nobody knows about. Nobody knows about the mysteries. They were incredible. I just want to know everything at all. And, um, <sighs> I mean, that's it. That's it. I just don't know anything, and I want to. And next, Sade asks, how many men slide into your DMs or tag you on social media trying to mansplain mythology to you? Be honest. Uh, in my DMs, almost none, which is chill. I have, like, weirdly fine dms it's weird sometimes i think something's wrong because people are usually awful on twitter every once in a while people will try to explain mythology to me and it's very funny like yeah it it, it does get entertaining um i'll like tweet something about theseus being shit and they'll be like here's the real myth and i'm like i fucking know the myths i just still think he's shit because it's obvious he is and anyway uh it happens a lot on twitter for sure thank you And now I want to pull us back to the episodes I did on my favorite epic, My Main Man's Wild Odyssey. But we're not going to hear about Odysseus, no. 
Because I feel like sharing a moment about Telemachus being a little dweeb and Penelope being seriously awesome and mostly the suitors being obnoxious. As soon as Odysseus didn't return home from Troy, the suitors assumed he was dead, and they've been here trying to convince my mother to marry one of them ever since. Can you imagine? My god, that would suck so much. All these strange dudes in your house constantly hitting on you, and when they're not, they're just drinking and being noisy assholes. Penelope has the patience of a saint, I swear. And now we have something from Rachel, who said, Good afternoon, LTAMB Pantheon. In summer of 2021, Spotify suggests your conversation episode with Emma Polly about Dionysus as non-binary and their interpretation of Euripides' back eye. I've been interested in Greek mythology and tragedy since I was a kid, so I was fascinated by Polly's perspective, and I loved how genuinely interested and excited you were. After listening to the whole conversation, I went back and started with episode one, and I've been listening ever since. I really love the different themes you do, like pride, spooky season, and the annual deep dives. I also love that you confront systemic cruelty and how you use your platform to amplify marginalized perspectives. As a queer woman with indigenous roots, your solidarity means a lot. I also think it's pretty cool that you're from the PNW. Love, Charlotte and have an elderly cat because ditto (laughs) and then rachel moves on to questions in the iliad book three we see helen get upset about not seeing her brothers when she's talking with the king a little later helen gets pissed at aphrodite and basically tells her to fuck off for turning helen's life upside down how likely is it that helen was addressing aphrodite as an irritating sister rather than an irritating olympian they were both known to the world as daughters of zeus powerful and famous in their own rights helen seems to be fed up in general and then her sister pushes her buttons the way only a sibling can now it's so funny you mentioned this moment because i actually like i didn't really remember it all that well it's been too long since i've read the iliad um i cannot wait for emily wilson's new translation then i will read the iliad again but in the meantime literally days ago uh, i recorded a conversation that's going to come out in a month or two with ruby blondell and they have just written a book uh, called Helen of Troy in Hollywood. And it's all about these, the representations of Helen in various Hollywood pieces. But this moment in the Iliad came up, like I asked a question and they replied to my question, basically with like this as an example. And so what they said is that this is really like a good example of less so sibling rivalry, I think. Like in my opinion, the gods tend, for the most part, tend not to acknowledge sibling relationships other than Artemis and Apollo, right? Like, you know, they, like there's not really a lot of representations of siblings, you know, doing normal stuff. So I take it more, and I think this is what Ruby was saying as well, that it's more about Helen showing her power, her like, almost like she actually does kind of rival Aphrodite in a way that no one else does um, because Helen is like that beautiful, that powerful. Like she holds all of that within her, you know, beauty, whatever that ends up meaning. Um, Because I had actually mentioned how Aphrodite never gets like angry at Helen for being so beautiful. And that feels like an Aphrodite thing to do. And Ruby mentioned this is like almost like the opposite too. of like Helen actually really like stands up to her in a way that's really fascinating. But shortly after like Aphrodite does kind of like put her back in her place a little bit. I don't know. That's not like an actual answer to anything, but I think it's a fascinating reference and really well timed on your part. And then Rachel says, in general, Aphrodite is notorious for doing what and who she wants when she wants, despite being married to Hephaestus. As far as we know, Greek women were largely required to be faithful and despised for being sexual, like today's Madonna slash whore complex. The goddess of love, desire, and sexuality can't also be a model of chastity and obedience. The Greeks were also ableist. Their myths were for explaining the world and things had to make some sense. Could Aphrodite and Hephaestus have been forced to marry so that she could be an unfaithful wife without real 
follow retribution and he could be constantly humiliated by her infidelity without it actually breaking social norms. I can't imagine Aphrodite would be able to embody feminine sexuality if she were married to someone respected by the laws and customs, not even if it was Ares. Obviously, he had a special emotional bond with Aphrodite and they were happy together, but I can't see the guy being okay with his wife getting her dolmades stuffed elsewhere, you know? <laughs> The Dolmatas bit really got me. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot happening here. Like, I don't want to say with confidence because we really can't know these things. But I do think um, that Hephaestus being the disabled god, you know, it's not irrelevant to his relationship with Aphrodite. Um, you know, it, it all comes about where Zeus is like basically mad that Aphrodite does have such sexual agency. And so she he tries to lock her down with this marriage um, you know, originally it's just sort of marriage to anyone and ends up being Hephaestus. And so I think that that is, yeah, it's not irrelevant that she is married to the disabled God and that she like, for all intents and purposes, based on what we know, they're never together, like sexually or anything. They don't have kids, any of that. Right. Whereas she's with like lots of other people, mostly Aries. Uh, and so like, I don't, I think that that's definitely connected, but my gut on it is that it also has a lot to do with what I covered in last week's episode. Aphrodite's connections to the East, it, it, to me, it feels like a conflict. It feels like this sexually free, you know, goddess of, of, of sex and passion melding with a more traditional, a more conservative culture that is the ancient Greek world. And it's like they tried to like squish the two together. And what came out was Aphrodite. You know, because she's got these really conflicting kind of concepts within her character. So to me, it feels like squishing these things together and just kind of trying to make them fit. Now, all of that said, like the idea that we have about women in ancient Greece, like I said, is really based on Athens. So we don't actually know that their sexuality was as locked down elsewhere um, than in that it was in Athens. We know that it was in Athens, but they could have had more freedom elsewhere. So we can't really say with certainty, but I still, yeah, I really think that that's why Aphrodite is so contradictory in so many fascinating ways that she's just kind of like a bunch of different concepts from different cultures tried and, and then the Greeks fit her to their own and sort of made whatever changes were necessary. That's what it feels like to me. I don't know. I think it's fascinating all around just to like even imagine all of these different ideas about her. Oh, also Rachel ended by asking me to tell Lupin that he's great. And I just want to say that I have done so. And to just add as a note, uh, because there's a PNW Olympic mountains or Olympia reference, um, I can see the Olympic mountains from my apartment. So hi, thanks. <laughs> All right. Next up from Ash, who says, are there any stories or mentions of the goddess Selene? I'm a moon child slash creature of the night, and I would love to find out more. Also, you're a badass and I love you. Thank you. Um, so Selene is kind of a mysterious goddess. And by mysterious, I do just mean she's one of those goddesses that is more practical in nature and less about her stories, right? She is the moon. And so I don't think that it was really necessary that she featured into stories because it was just like, well, the moon's there, you know? Um, all of that said, she does have a story with a guy named Endymion. I always forget what happens. And I always think that I've covered it. And I don't think that I actually have it's a weird one in my brain, but I will cover it one day. For now, I just know their names, Selene and Endymion. Um, but otherwise, yeah, Selene is really a, a practical goddess. Uh, she is the moon and thus, you know, it's necessary. And very closely related, Ella next asked, Helios or Apollo? Sun god default? Selene or Artemis too? Great timing. So this is a great question and one that I find totally fascinating because, yes, we have these really contradictory ideas. We have Helios is the sun god. He, like, is the sun. Selene is the moon goddess. She is the moon. And then we have these ideas that Apollo is a sun god and that Artemis is a moon goddess. And my general understanding and sort of what I've gathered just from all of my varied readings is that it's really a matter of cultural evolution, I guess, like anthropological changes within the people that are dealing with these mythologies on a daily basis. Like Helios and Selene are coming from this older tradition, this sort of, you know, early archaic period where the theogony is kind of coming into existence. And there, Greece is a much more, you know, they're a less advanced 
society than they will become. And so to me, it seems like in that time, they would have a more practical need for these gods that represent such individual concepts. So like Apollo as an Olympian can't actually, he can't also be the sun because he's an Olympian. You know, he's got far too much to do. Helios has to have that be his entire job. And the same applies to Selene and Artemis. Whereas as time goes on and the Greek world culturally evolves and anthropologically evolves like as human beings coming into the world they find you know as they're as they evolve with science and things like that too like they would then inherently have less of a need for these really practical deities you know you it, once you understand more about science and the universe you don't need helios to be the sun and instead, you can have Apollo be a sun god. He represents the sun. You know, he still has these stories connecting with the physical aspect of the sun crossing the sky. But you don't need this, like, exact direct deity for it. I just, this is all my, like, sort of my own ideas around it. But it seems to me that that's what would happen. And, like, in terms of timeline of when Apollo is called a sun god and when Artemis is called a moon goddess, it is later. It is much later in the general, the grand scheme of these mythologies and the people, you know, who are who are living them on a daily basis. And since we had that great couple of questions from Rachel earlier, some relating to the Trojan War, I want to play one of my favorite moments from covering the Trojan War. I was really proud of this when I wrote it. It is my recap of everything that happened during the war. I think it, it aired in the lead up or the very beginning to my first Odyssey episode so I could remind everyone what had happened and I just love it. So I'm going to play it. So let's just recap the important stuff before we delve right in to this magnificent piece of ancient literature, shall we? 1. Eris tossed the apple of discord into the wedding celebrations of Peleus and Thetis. Shit went down, goddess versus goddess. Aphrodite was deemed the winner by Paris because she was willing to give him a hot woman to have sex with. 2. Two dudes got super mad about this. Menelaus, king of Sparta, because Helen was his wife and now she was having sex with Paris. And Agamemnon, because he's a warmonger the likes of a great many American presidents. <gasps> Whoops, did I say that? Three. Basically, every other king in Greece was forced to go to war against Troy with Menelaus and Agamemnon because of the hot lady. They'd pledged some dumb shit back when every man in Greece wanted to marry her. It's a whole thing and it's pretty silly. 4. They meet in Aulis, but god damn it if there isn't any wind! Agamemnon sacrifices his own daughter to fix that, and they all head to war. 5. The war is long. Long, long, long. There's a lot of death, a lot of gore, zero romance no matter what the movie Troy leads you to believe. And in the end, nothing good comes from it. Seriously, it probably wasn't a true story, but what it was was the first parable about how stupid war is and how it really just ruins everything and no one gets what they want. 6. Everyone heads home from war. Some people make it, some people, like Agamemnon, return home with another woman after 10 years and are immediately killed in the bathtub by their wives and their wives' new lovers. Sucker. 7. Agamemnon's kids don't love this, and they see about killing their mother and her new lover and then getting hounded by furies until finally Apollo comes down and wraps things up in a nice little bow by telling everyone to get married. And this next question is from Santiago, who says, Hi, so have you considered to talking about Native American mythology? Maybe comparing them. Also, I love the POV you give to each Greek story. Thank you. And no. <laughs> um, I mean, not least because I really prefer to stay in the ancient Mediterranean. It's where my passion lies. But most importantly, um, as a person, a white, a white person from Canada, this is... Uh, North American mythology, but specifically, of course, mythology from where I live is not mine. Um, you know, I'm not Greek, obviously, but there is a, an inherent difference between Greek mythology that has become so taken over by the Western world that it has become like Western mythology and the mythology of a people that my country is actively oppressing, right? Like Canada 
is a mess. So it is a purely Canadian point of view that I'm coming from in my answer that it is not my place. It should not be my place. And I would not ever attempt to even consider it to be my place to talk about Indigenous mythologies. Um, you know, obviously, there it's completely different when you get to the South. I recognize that I'm talking entirely from a Canadian perspective in that God, that's not my place. I am a white colonialist Canadian. You know, I, I come from the people who fucked it all up. And so, like, uh, you know, I'm hands off all the way. <laughs> it's a good question. And so I, that's why I want to clarify that my answer is purely from a white Canadian perspective. And I've got something from Becky. And she says, this isn't really a question, more a story. In 2019, my anxiety got really bad to the point where I was off work and had to fight through nausea every morning when I did go back. One of the only distractions that worked for me was music. And eventually I branched out to look for something else to fill my ears. And that was when I found your podcast. Before I knew it, I could get up in the morning, go on bus journeys, and just generally be alone as long as I had you in my ear telling me tales of mythology. Now my anxiety is much better, but I am forever thankful to you for bringing these stories to the world, Liv, and for keeping me company during some of my darkest days. I'm so thankful for you. I made a note uh, when I was <laughs> collecting these um, that I would just improvise responses and try not to cry. Um, so that's what I'm doing. But honestly, like, I mean, it means the entire world to me that 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 you've told me that. I'm really glad you're doing better. And it's really fucking nice that I helped. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, the next one's from Serena. It says, what will you be reading after Ovid's Metamorphoses on the podcast? Perhaps Photius's Bibliotheca excerpts? LOL, just kidding. Yeah, you're kidding. That's right. Um, no, I think that I'm probably going to go to Pseudo Apollodorus um, because it would be fun, frankly, and silly and like everything happens there. And, you know, it's just a good one. And next, Luke says, how long do you see your podcast going for? Do you still have plenty of tales to tell or are the days numbered? I hope it does have plenty more life in it. I'm a new listener. I've started at the very beginning. So I apologize if you've covered this topic in your later episodes. That's a great question. Um, it's an important question given the content that I do. And while, you know, I think I can safely say that there aren't a lot of myths, like physical, not physical, but a lot of uh, explicit myths, I should say, that I haven't covered yet. Uh, but at the same time, there are so many that I covered so early on that there is just like literally so much more to say about the stories than I was able to say back then. So I will I redo some of those, um, particularly when like I want to. Uh, but also there are so many more plays to get to. Like, honestly, I haven't even scratched the surface of the plays. So there's so much there. And there's really there's so much still for me to work off of. So I got another I got years more not to worry and next up from Susanna, who says, Hi, live long time listener, first time questioner. I have recently become obsessed with the Chthonic gods. Yes, a little bit because of Hades. And was trying desperately to find more sources of their myths or stories. Do you have any good recommendations on where to look? I know you've covered some of them, but I find them fascinating and don't seem to see their, them being talked about anywhere. Love your podcast so much. Best part of my week is listening to you nerd out about myths. That's a great question. I think a really easy answer to like why you don't see a lot is that they didn't really like talk a lot about what happened in the underworld, both because I think that they like didn't feel like they knew, but also it's like it's the place of the death of the dead and, and death generally. So like, I just don't think it was like a, a common topic. All of that said, I would direct you to many time guest. I'm going to forget whether she's done three or four episodes of the podcast, but Dr. Ellie Mack and Roberts, who has written a book called Underworld Gods. I think there's a subtitle, but I think if you were to Google Ellie Mack and Roberts and Underworld Gods, you're going to get it. It is like an academic book, but it's so helpful and so interesting. And Ellie is so great. So I really highly recommend that you pick that one up. Um, it is more expensive because it's an academic book, but I got it on like an ebook and it was considerably cheaper, definitely more affordable. And I imagine it goes on sale now and then. Either way, highly recommend that one. And also like Ellie's just great. And hey, since we're talking about the underworld and things that can land you in the bad place down there, let's have a listen to that damned curse of Atreus that I love so much. Atreus tells his brother that he's been forgiven, so Thyestes returns to Mycenae thinking it's all good. 
No news on whether it's a red flag to Thyestes that Aeropay has been drowned. But all the same, Atreus invites Thyestes to a reconciliation celebration. Feast in honor of these brothers burying the hatchet. How sweet, right? For dinner, Atreus kills Thyestes' sons, cuts them up, cooks them, and feeds them to his brother. There's a really pleasant theme in this family. Now we all remember how the gods feel about cannibalism, particularly when it's a family member. Big, big no-no. Thankfully a no-no in most polite societies, but the gods particularly found this to be the worst of the worst. We're told that the sky darkens as Atreus commits this crime, that the sun hides from the sight. And next from Lane, and he says, I just wanted to say thank you so much for all the amazing work you do and have done for the past six years. I found Let's Talk About Myths Baby my senior year of high school, and it reignited my love for the myths. Your podcast even led me to add a classic spiner to my college degree, which has been one of the highlights of my last four years at university. Thank you so much. That's so nice. And also, it blows my whole mind that somebody could have been in high school and then also do four years of university, all while I've been talking into this microphone. And like, objectively, I know that obviously that's the case because it's been six years and that's just how time works. Um, But once you get to be like full blown adult where you don't mark things by school, time gets really weird. Anyway, thank you. (laughs) Next, we have one from Isla, who says, as there are many, many versions of basically any myth, how do you choose which to tell? Like, do you tell the one that makes the most sense to you or the one you heard first, the one you like best, which is told more often, etc.? That's a great question. Um, I mean, so... I think, yeah, I, I it totally depends on the, the story, honestly. Sometimes sources are more detailed. Like, as you guys have often heard, I rely on Ovid sometimes because he'll, he's often the most detailed source that we have for something or something, like, doesn't exist at all except in, like, Pseudo Apollodorus or it's, like, two sentences elsewhere or what have you. So it totally depends on the myth, what there is. Sometimes it's which one do I like better or sometimes it's just, like, which one's most entertaining or the oldest or all these different kind of factors that go in. But these days with the the newer episodes where I'm really obsessed with ancient sourcing and telling you guys everything, I'll often explain why I chose something or I'll tell you all the alternatives that I've found just because it's fun and I'm really nerdy. And next we have one from Mara who says, I just wanted to say how grateful I am for this podcast. As I'm writing this, I'm doing an archaeology conservation program in Corinth, and I don't think this would be possible without Myths Baby. Reigniting my passion for mythology and ancient history. For reference, I'm an undergrad psychology major. How would you describe your experience in classical studies, especially at the graduate level? Do you recommend it? So here's where I have to admit, well, and I I have said it before, but I don't have a graduate degree in classics. I only have a BA. Um, so I can't speak to graduate school. Uh, but I mean, my my degree was great. Yeah. Like, it was fun because it's Greek history and mythology and stuff. I mean, I graduated like over 10 years ago now, which is fucking bananas. Like I said about time. It's super weird. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I would highly recommend it just because it's nerdy and it's fun. So like, why the hell not? I mean, obviously, there's lots of reasons why not with university. It's fucking expensive. But like, in terms of the actual classics of it all, Fun. Next, I've got one from Martha, who says, Hi Liv, I'm in high school and have an amazing Latin teacher, which is very lucky, as it is not a private school. I was wondering if you ever had any really inspiring professors or teachers. That's so cool that you get to do Latin in a public school and that you have a great teacher. Like, that's fucking awesome. That makes me really happy. Um, There was definitely no Latin in my public school. But uh, in terms of teachers, yes, absolutely. I had the greatest history teacher, um, just absolutely the best. And he definitely, definitely inspired my love of history. I was into ancient history before. So like he definitely, he didn't teach a lot of of ancient history. It was a lot of modern, but like just the concept of it alone, definitely hugely inspired by him. Having a good teacher is so important and I'm glad you have one. And we have one from Tomi who says, a question you might get a lot, but as you really start to get through the remaining Greek and Roman myths, will you ever venture into other cultures? Your Mesopotamia episodes are my absolute favorite ones. I really enjoy when you dive into stories of surrounding areas like the Iphis and Ianthe, Dido, etc. So that is a great question. Um, t- so to an extent, so like obviously I dip my toes into Rome sometimes and that won't stop other than like 
depends because Rome just can be weird. I like to really pick and choose with my Rome. Um, and I really am interested in Mesopotamia and just, I mean, the whole region. Basically, the ancient Mediterranean is my jam, right? So I'm staying there broadly. As for actually, like, storytelling the other mythologies, it is a fine line, um, you know, because these are typically from cultures that are now often treated very poorly by the West and by, you know, the white of the West. And so I really am very conscious of what I do and do not do and what is and is not my place. Um, so we'll kind of see. That said, I would love to have guests talk about those places and those mythologies. So that is absolutely a goal of mine. Um, as for the storytelling, it is a little bit different. I also do like my knowledge is in how to research Greece and Rome. And I fear that I would not do the other cultures justice because I, you have to really know where to look to find the right sources and you have to have the context. And I only have the context for Greece, you know? So it's really tricky. Um, it sort of remains to be seen, but guests, fuck, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Next up, we have one from M who says, oh, what's your favorite episode or mini myth series that you have released? My favorite to listen to was the Constellation Myths. How fun. Okay. So I was thinking about this a lot. And a lot of times it's like a play that I wasn't expecting. Like the Alcestis blew my mind. I had so much fun. Same with the Helen. Both of those were like so unexpected and so joyful. But because it is most recent in my mind and was truly the biggest joy fucking ever, as I talked about earlier, you know, I needed to fix my ADHD. It was really, really, really driving me nuts. So I needed to pick something fun. And so I went with Bellerophon and the Chimera for next week. And I just, oh my God, it was so much fun. It was so much fun to write the script. It was so much fun to record it. I, uh, it is a wild episode. It, I... I'm so entertained by it and I hope you all are too. And so, you know, since you asked and since this is on my mind, this is a clip from the episode that will come out next week. So you haven't even heard it yet, but here's just a little teaser on Bellerophon and the Chimera because fuck, I love the Chimera so much. Which means it's now my time to shine as if the rest of this episode hasn't been my time to regale you with the details on my all-time favorite greek mythological monster she who rules the plains of lycia causing trouble and fire in her wake the fucking chimera why is the chimera so magnificent you ask gods that you even have to ask has me questioning all of your virtues, but fine, now let me tell you. There are so many monsters of Greek myth, and sure, they are all wonderful and weird in their own unique ways, but how many of them include fire-breathing goat heads? Exactly, just one. Not only does the Chimera appeal to every kind of monster that you might want, like big scary cat, check, angry serpent, check furious fire breathing head of an animal that otherwise should be harmless and silly fucking check well oh my gosh nerds Thank you so much for listening to that. Thank you for listening to some of the sections with the bad audio. <laughs> I'm so annoyed with myself. I can't believe I did it. I've now spent like four hours recording this and it should have taken me an hour because I literally made a mistake that I haven't made in years. Like the irony of doing it on my six year anniversary episode. Thankfully, it's so egregious that I've just been laughing about it. But there were just, there were some good improv bits that I just knew I couldn't do again. Um, and also, you know, I didn't want to lose my whole mind. So thank you for listening to those sections with the less than quality audio. But otherwise, this was so much fun. I'm so grateful for all of your questions. I have so many more to get to. So do not worry if yours was not answered. I'm going to answer a ton more next week or not next week on Friday. Um, that's going to have a lot more. There's going to be uh, some clips from conversations and reading episodes that I feel like sharing just to celebrate, you know, all the things 
that this podcast has been over the last six years and all the things that I like hope it continues to be, you know? So anyway, you're all lovely. I'm so grateful for you as listeners. Thank you for being with me, whether you've been here the whole six years, in which case, holy shit, bananas, I love you. Or if you are fresh and new, generally, thank you. Like the fact that this is my job is fucked up in the best possible way. I still don't fully understand it. I kind of always expect it's going to blow up in my face and I'm trying to actively not worry about that all the time because it's just so cool and nice and you're all so cool and nice and thank you all so much. I'm going to stop now. Let's talk about Miss Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians and has the new title of assistant producer because it turns out that's basically been what she's doing and I'm just figuring it all out as we go. The podcast is hosted and monetized by iHeartMedia. Listen to the podcast on Spotify or wherever you want to listen. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron, where you'll get access to bonus episodes and more, including episodes like this. So remember, the main thing I do on Patreon is monthly, what I call God of the Month. I pick a topic or rather I do a poll for a topic. It's a God or a concept or a place or what have you. Um, and all my patrons can ask questions and then I answer like this. So it's really like real and natural and it's super fun. So, you know, join me if you want to. And generally, thank you all so fucking much. Holy shit. Six years. What's happening? Whew, I am Liv and I love this shit. Like, so fucking much. It really has not changed in six years whatsoever. I argue, I mean, I love it so much more now if I really think about it. So much more. I've learned so much.